now I would like to invite uh, Professor Julia McDougall to join us on stage. He is a professor in media and, and education head of the Center for Excellence in Media Practice and principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy. He is the author of a range of books, chapters, journal articles, and reports in the fields of media education, literacy, and pedagogy. His speech will be around the uses of literacy. Thank you, and you can hear me okay. Please stay, I'm only going to be 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I have a flight to catch, so I can guarantee I'm only going to be 15 minutes. Okay, I'm sorry. I have three apologies. Firstly, I, I'm sorry I'm from the UK, sorry about Brexit. Secondly, um, sorry I'm not David Buckingham. I, I can't help it, I'm just not. Um, and I now have to apologize as well, because that would have been a really interesting panel with an activity and very interactive, but now it's had to be changed and shortened just so. I can come on here and talk. So, three apologies, that's done. Um, I'm gonna talk for 12 minutes and show you a three minute video and then we're out of here, lunch, and uh, I promise I won't go over. Um, I'm going to say some sobering things, I think, about media literacy, and so that's a fourth apology before I start. But I have worked in media education myself for 20 years, more than 20 years, and I studied media at university myself before. So for about 25 years, I've been in this project, media education, media literacy. Um, so I include myself in these observations and in these reflections. Um, I'm not saying it's about a community I'm not part of myself. Um, can my slides appear? There they are, okay. So. The Uses of Literacy was written 60 years ago, 1957, by Richard Hoggart. It remains a seminal text in the fields of literacy education, and media education, and by extension, media literacy education. This book is frequently revisited by teachers, academics, researchers, cultural commentators to address current issues in literacy education and social mobility. Exploring the uses of literacy amongst working class communities in the north of England, the book warned of popular culture's pacifying influence on the working class and set up an opposition between keen readers making use of mass literacy as an emancipatory affordance and the consumers of the new world of media culture. Thus, the uses of literacy are understood by Hoggart as double-edged, on the one hand enabling ordinary people new opportunities for social mobility and on the other as a, con as a controlling force for the powerful. Hoggart's concern was with the relative benefits and threats to people of the transition to a mass popular culture. Our concern here at Media Meets Literacy in Sarajevo has been with the educational benefits of media literacy and by extension, extension the social benefits. But my observation is that we've spent, again, more time on the threats than we have on educational practice, on teaching and on learning. We've spent more time, again, on the what of media literacy than the how of media literacy education. So 60 years on from Hoggart's book, media literacy is nothing new. We should understand our work here as being in a maturation phase for the field, beyond restating the need for media literacy, beyond definitions and beyond models of competence, towards enabling capable and transformative uses of media literacy. Consider who uses media literacy with the most success. Then consider whether those uses are pleasing to us. Or whether we are happy that the most successful uses of media literacy are, I don't think it's controversial to say, generally reproductive of existing power relations. Generally corporate, exploitative, manipulative, oppressive, or terrorist. In those 60 years, we've moved through the rapid development of mass media to the internet, Web 2.0, Media 2.0, and the proliferation of ed tech. John Potter, who spoke last night, and I have tried to account for the role of digital media in education and the uses of media literacy in our recent book by applying a conceptual framework from our two legacy traditions, first cultural studies and second new literacy studies. So I want to spend a few minutes now rehearsing the main conceptual framings offered to us by those two traditions. Firstly, cultural studies, and I want at the same time to pay tribute in this to the recently departed late Stuart Hall. So first cultural studies, could we please play the video? Here we go. 
We live in a world saturated with media. We see our reality through them. But these are not transparent operations. They involve the workings of power. Stuart Hall was an outsider, born in colonial Jamaica, educated in Oxford. He was out of place in both. He left academia, the literary canon, high culture, to become an intellectual of mass culture. What he did was controversial. He was looking at the power of mainstream media in representing race, gender, class, ethnicity, religion. Hall said those discourses are not innocent, that hidden in mass media is ideology. The media theorist's job is to find that ideology, expose it, critique it. The media's racialization of crime, the patriarchal narratives on gender, the othering of immigrants, Muslims, the poor. The media are active agents in this process. But what of the masses? The audience is watching. Hall broke with the presumption that the masses are dumb, passive. In fact, he questioned who the faceless masses even are. Some may accept the dominant meanings embedded in the media. Some may negotiate them. Others outright reject them. Where other media theorists argued that messages are imposed on people from above, Hall said power is not as simple as that. He saw pockets of resistance that undermine dominant media narratives. Think of the bloggers in Tunisia, the graffiti artists of Brazil, Black Lives Matter. But Hall went further. He also told us to seek out stories elsewhere, in the lowly, despised spaces of knowledge. The gossip mags, the soap opera, the music videos. If you want to understand society, then maybe avoid the news. Those formalised spaces that house official discourse. Find different stories, different perspectives, different realities. Okay, thank you. Um, so for me, the first legacy we should be working with always is cultural studies, um, but it raises some questions there about a, a, a putting fake news in opposition with authentic news as though news is now something we can see as neutral and authoritative. Um, and the second legacy uh, is from the New Literacy Studies Group and notably from Brian Street, who also sadly died, so another tribute I, I need to pay. So our theoretical roots are framed by cultural studies in tandem with social literacies from Brian Street and others and the New Literacy Studies School, recently reappraised in René Hobbes' project on the grandparents of media literacy. So in my view, all of our work should be informed by and speak to and be theorised by both cultural studies and social literacies. And social literacies tells us that media literacy is best understood as a set of social practices rather than technical skills. There are different media literacies associated with different domains of life. Media literacy practices are patterned by social institutions and power relationships. And some media literacies have become more dominant, visible, and influential than others. So some thoughts and provocations with those things in mind. Does media liter literacy protectionism around things like fake news actually reinforce mainstream media hegemony? Is the competence model of media literacy in the community ignoring both of these formative, tra formative traditions? Note these are provocations and thoughts, not that I think this, right? These are questions. Are we doing this? 
Does media literacy do little to develop critical pedagogies of resistance, the third spaces? I think we could agree that in the, in the brilliant and informative sessions we've been in over the last two days, it's rare that we really talk about teaching and learning and how we approach these things through pedagogy. Some media literacies are given privilege over others, perhaps, and do those competence models support a schooled version of media literacy in the same way as English literature um, uh, promotes a schooled version of literacy that renders most people illiterate rather than including them as literate? Are we in danger of doing that? And are we in danger of accepting static media literacy models that can't in integrate the kinds of dynamic literacies that John and I have written about um, in the book? I don't know, but they're thoughts. I'm also keenly aware that there's a highly specific context here in Sarajevo, of course, and you don't need me to tell you this, and I'm not qualified coming from the UK to lecture you on it by any means, so I won't. But recently, I've given speeches and run workshops on media literacy in Lebanon, in South Africa, in Latvia, and in each region, the objective of what we were doing was to conceive of a third space between the global frameworks from the US, the EU, UNESCO, and our conceptual legacies, cultural studies and new literacy studies, and the clear and present media literacy needs of people in those localities. Just as Hoggart was thinking about the specific experiences of people in Hunslet, Yorkshire, in the north of England in the 1950s, we can't just import models, competences, and concepts, for example, civic engagement, into local contexts without being acutely sensitive to the need to work in a reciprocal way. And how reflexive are we as a community of practice? Have we thought about what and who we represent when we talk about media literacy to each other? Whose literacy are we privileging? Who gets to speak? Who is spoken for and about? At the Media Education Summit, which my research center convenes every year, we'll be in Hong Kong next year, Florence the year after, we hope, Beirut in 2020, depending on all kinds of things. At that conference, we include a youth summit. So we're forced to put our research findings and arguments about young people and their media engagements into dialogue with young people. It's often quite uncomfortable because they tell us that the things we're saying about them are strange to them, but rightly so. But which media literate selves do we present to one another in these communities and who do we ignore? Perhaps media literacy itself shouldn't be the goal. Perhaps we should be focusing more on the uses of media literacy. And we might work with a concept like capability from SEN, where a person's use of resources converts to functionings, and those functionings convert to more holistic capability for which media and digital literacy might be a conduit. Perhaps we should be thinking more about what people do with these skills that we're helping them to develop. Media literacy is used I'm sorry, still, mostly for bad things and often by white men. Are we thinking about this? Is our project, therefore, so far a failure? Offer a positive celebratory wrapping up of the conference, they said. But I think it's something for us to go away thinking about. It's been an amazing conference. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful and, and honored to be here as David Buckingham's replacement, but nevertheless. But, you know, these are serious things I think we need to think about as well as celebrating our work as, as we go forward. So to finish, what di and I include myself, what different uses of media literacy do you, do we, want to see as a result of our work in our local contexts? If nothing else, I've stuck exactly to time. <laughs> enjoy your lunch, enjoy your travels. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs>